Welcome back. And today we're with Mike over here at Imperial Carbide. And we're going to be doing a little bit of a video tour of Mike's plant. And uh, I'd like to introduce Mike and also maybe have a little bit of a discussion of how you're here, how you got here, and, uh, you know, why we have some some drinks on the table here and some other things. But tell me a little bit about yourself and, and how we got to this point or how you got to this point. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, like your, like yourself, Doug, I'm a second generation tool shop owner. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, so uh, my dad started uh, started the company in 1966, you know, with uh, with some other guys from uh, from Talon mm -hmm. also. They served their apprenticeship there and, uh, you know, which was the manufacturer of the zipper. Yep. You know, and all the tooling and the chain machines that, uh, you know, put the zipper in automation. And, uh, you know, honestly, we've uh, we've been continuing a, a similar trend, you know, with that type of manufacturing here, of, you know, since then. Um, yeah. Yeah, I got uh, I got here right out of the Navy, you know, in 1984. Been here ever since. And and your dad and his partner were running the company. You knew about that. You did all your schooling and night schooling, trade schools, to move into the operation. Then, or? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, you know, through high school and everything, uh, I didn't uh, I didn't really know much about the tool business. Uh, you know, you know, of course. Uh, we were always working on cars mm -hmm. or motorcycles. You know, we always had a little bit of a mechanical fun. Yeah. You know, but uh, uh, actually, I was an aircraft electrician in the Navy. You know, and, and learned how to do that, and then transferred everything over to the mechanical after I got out. Okay. You know, so I came in fresh. I didn't know anything about this. Yeah. You know? All right. So, so we're here at your business today. There is. Uh, there's four buildings on site of your, what would you call it, a campus? Or uh, yeah, it's turned into that, you know. So, you so uh, what what started out with uh, with two guys and uh, and barely enough money to you know buy their first machine, you know, is uh, is now uh, 90 people. I want to say uh, we've got over 60, 70 thousand square feet, you know, uh, you know. And we have the ability to manufacture anything from start to finish in house. Okay. You know. And and maybe let's I guess let's talk about this. This is some uh, old smoky moonshine, and we got uh, some beer here. And I guess maybe tell them a little bit about what we're going to see out there. Now we're not going to actually see the the lids or the cans or anything being made, but a lot of people don't understand what actually goes into making a I would call it a simple lid in most people's minds. But when you see your operation and yes. what you do to produce a simple lid, is far from simple. I don't yeah, think so we've said it yet, but you produce stamping dies to the most part here. The tooling that go into stamping dies, that, progressive dies, that, if you that's, will. That's right. Uh, like uh, high-speed progressive dies. Uh, you know, for instance, these are uh, you know these are uh, aluminum can lids. Yep, like you know. what you would see on top of a beer can, a Coke can, a pop can. Right, right. So, so these dies, uh, these dies run uh, 800 hits a minute, and there's tens of thousands of these dies all over the world. So you can okay. imagine, you know, the uh, the millions and millions of uh, you know uh, aluminum cans and aluminum tabs and yeah. aluminum uh, aluminum lids. Uh, that are produced at that speed, you know. Okay. Um, and and just so they understand, yeah. when when one of these lids is made, and they they you said that they go in there once they've made the lid, they crimp it around the cans. They do. What you said. So in a progressive stamping die, that lid is not made in one complete motion, correct? No, that that's correct. Actually, I have a sample of that okay. right here. All right. You well, know, while so. he steps off camera, there he's going to show us a. A progressive or a progression of the pull tab because that's yes. that's a separate piece as well. Yeah. So so basically, an aluminum sheet starts uh, starts feeding through the die. Okay. And uh, and in progression, you know, it it's it starts off by simple uh, simple stamping, and then of course it starts rolling. Now what happens is uh, that this die. Uh, feeds into another die that's producing the uh, the lid. Okay. Okay, and it'll come in and it'll actually rivet that thing on. In the, in the progression. Yes. Okay. Yes, and and then uh, the lids will shoot off a conveyor. You know, they mm. get uh, they get stacked into another machine. So then, when it comes off of that set of dies and the can lid set of dies, yeah, it becomes one 
and then that becomes a piece of inventory. That's that's correct. Okay. Those go on to the machine that uh, that forms the actual aluminum can. Okay. And then it goes in, it gets filled with whatever the, your beverage is, you know, uh, you know, and then that cap will get coined, you know, around the uh, around the, the seal. Okay. And then it goes right into robotic packaging. You know, and then uh, then right into right into shipping. So in most instances, yeah, the dyes that you're producing that produce the can, and the lid and everything else are also in the same filling type of factory where they're filling it with whatever liquid it is yes, at the time. Yes, yes, it's a complete uh, huh, it, it's okay. a complete assembly line. So they're not producing it's, a can and then shipping empty can somewhere. No, they're producing a can at the same factory. That they're actually doing the filling and, and all that. That that's correct. I guess yeah. I was not aware of that. I yeah, didn't know yeah, how that it's uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty impressive. Yeah. You know, it is a uh, it is one complete progression of a, a product shipped right to your store. Okay. You know, uh, and same same thing with like for instance a jar lid. Mm -hmm. You know, the jar lid. Uh, you know, of course, isn't uh, isn't done complete. You know, the jar lids are shipped out to the jar manufacturers. And then they uh, they fill it with whatever beverage, and then automatically seal it, and then it goes into the robotic packaging. Gotcha. Those are, of course, the uh, the largest producers of these products. Just want to make sure that all of you guys watching this video are crystal clear. Mm -hmm. And Mike, please explain what we just discussed. So we don't actually make the uh, make the lids, the cans. We don't fill them with beverages. We make all the tooling. Uh, that provides all of this to run at high speed. Okay. So in order for that to run at the uh, at the speed I mentioned, 800 hits a minute earlier, uh, you know, so that's flying. That's like Gatling gun fast. So when you're talking about these two things, these really aren't the only two types of tooling that you make. What else did, did the viewers put in their hand every day or use every day, do you produce tooling for? Well, uh, uh, cell phones would be uh, the first example. You know, we've got a uh, customer that uh, that makes capacitors that go in every cell phone, and they produce, I want to say, between 100 to 120 million capacitors a week. Off of the a week. A week off of the tooling. There. I don't know if you guys heard that clearly. 100 <laughs> to 120 million capacitors a week. Uh, correct. Oh. That's at the one facility. What else? What else? Cell phones? Uh, Razor blades. Right? Uh, so you guys out there shaving, and yeah, yeah. a lot of you guys that watch the channel probably don't even shave, but you still got to trim yourself up. Right, so right. You're making progressive dyes to stamp out well, a razor blade? Well, actually assembly machine uh, components. Okay. Uh, you know, you could, uh, if you could just picture... Uh, the razor blades getting inserted into a cartridge head at the speed of a Gatling gun. Hmm. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's it's a uh, pretty yeah. amazing. Well, it all has to be perfect. Yeah. You know, or it, it just won't work. One jam in the assembly line and just uh, just ruins productivity. Correct. Well, I think what we're going to do is yes. we're going to hop out of the office here mm -hmm. and. Uh, we're going to go around the, the plant and show you the different machining centers and things like that. Is there anything else off the top of your head you can think of um, that would be, I guess, interesting or important for the viewers to know? Well, uh, I, I think in our business, like any business, uh, you know, similar to your business, uh, you know, people are the key factor. You know, and, uh, you know, as, as impressive as all the super high speed precise million dollar pieces of equipment and all that stuff uh the guys behind them i think are the real the real history i'm there, glad you, you know. brought that up uh yeah. you know all of these machines that are sitting out to this out on your plant floor yeah. need somebody to enter a button or program something into it so the the people here are just as important Oh, this and, crew makes those machines sing and dance. Yep. It's, it's a very impressive. Yep. So, and, and we would call this a small manufacturing facility. Yes, uh, sir. And it's, it's just as important to you to have the right people here as it is to have the right equipment. Mm -hmm. One without the other just does not produce good parts and doesn't make good for sales. So yeah. let's go out and take a look at some of these people and some of the machines that are, that are paying the bills and keeping the lights on I'd around here. Love to show you around. All right, let's go. Perfect. All right, so we're over here in uh, one of your newly acquired buildings, and uh, you've turned this into, this is your raw steel. You get raw steel in to produce product 
for yourself, but tell me a little bit more about it because there's something here yeah. that a lot of people might not know. Well, that's that's correct, Doug. Uh, not only uh, not only do we inventory all the uh, all the materials that we manufacture our parts of, uh, you know, we're um, we're a complete materials broker, uh, you know, to sell uh, to sell any any machinable materials that other companies need yeah. uh, to them, and uh, we can help them control their costs. Uh, we do. Uh, fair amount of business locally, you know, okay. and, and uh, yeah, it's been working out really well. And so the, the types of steel that they sell here aren't what uh, the farmers would buy. They're not like a, uh, a pre-hard or a, a something like that. They're uh, a yeah. tool steel that when you, you, pr you purchase it when it's prior to it's been heat treated so you can machine it in most applications. That's, that's correct. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily be working a uh, you know, with the uh, the steel beams and the structural materials, you know, but uh, but I want to say uh, we've got low carbon steels, high carbon steels, uh, titanium, stainless steels, brass, copper. Uh, we what get about carbide? We get do you, anything. Do you, do you yes, uh, we we uh, we do a, a fair amount of uh, carbide parts as well. And do you sell carbide to other customers? Uh, we we don't normally sell carbide, okay. but we can get it. All yes. right. Yeah. So when we talk about tool steels, and uh, with my background, he's got a lot of O1, A2. They're all listed on the shelf. D2, S7, uh, 6061, A36, AR500. I can guarantee you, some of you guys have heard of AR500, which is plates down here. And a lot of people use AR500 for uh, shooting targets. Uh, bullet Bulletproof steel, that's yeah. correct. Uh, so, you know, we've... I don't know if you tinker in any uh, any AR-500 targets or not, but I just happened to notice the AR-500 steel. If you want an AR-500 target, I can make you one. All right. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so you, you look around the plant here, and then he's got a couple uh, band saws that are for cutting steel, not like uh, your wood my your wooden mills that you guys see, but very similar. Um, yeah, so these can, are these are neat. These are really neat saws. They uh, they're auto advancing, hydraulic clamping, uh, CNC controlled. So, Mike, when you talk about this thing in auto advancing, you've yes, got sir. this set up to cut off. I'm going to assume these these pucks. We'll call them a puck, and they'll cut it off, and it auto advances to a stop on there. And just keeps cutting whatever quantity you've you've inputted into that. that that's thing? that's correct. Uh, for the different materials, the different diameters, things like that, you program in your uh, your speeds and feeds recommended to get the longest tooth life out of your saw blade. Okay. And then you'll program. Uh, you'll set up the length of cut, and then uh, then yes, you'll program in uh, the number of parts that you want to cut off a bar. All right. You know, now, so it's very efficient. Now this this right here and there's a couple they must have just started this job but this right here might be something that a customer has called him and said hey i need 20 of these or you might have a job here that requires 10 of these so you can produce them over here in your your yeah. steel plant yeah this is a this is actually a job i need 110 pieces uh lefts and rights has 304 stainless steel and uh and that goes into a, a piece of food packaging equipment that seals Frito Lay uh, Frito bags. Uh, so fortunate to be surrounded by uh, uh, capability here. Uh, it's it's beyond measure. I, I'm, I'm very privileged. All right, Mike. So we're still in the the steel division where you sell the steel. But as I look over here, I notice you've got some machining centers. Can we you, do. Let's take a look over here and I guess maybe explain to me why you would have machining centers in your steel division. Well, it's it's pretty efficient, you know, in our lean manufacturing processes, Doug. Yeah. Uh, to go right from raw material directly into a directly into producing parts. All right. You know, so uh, for instance, uh, this is a, a lathe division. You know, and uh, it's where all the round bar that gets cut up it comes right off the saws. So you guys you took know? us from a saw. Yep. Put it in your lathe, and now you're turning it into some products uh, here. Yeah. So this this particular part here has got this machined on it prior to this one being machined open on that side. Now we get uh, with super finishes. We can polish on this other piece of equipment that we have. Um, 
and get uh, close to a two finish. All right. You know, so which is uh, nearly mirror. You, you know, can it's, step it's, over here and take a take a video of this and show the tooling that's in the end of this lathe. It's pretty impressive, the interchangeable tooling that goes into here. And 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 how many axis lathe is this, Mike? Do you know? Yeah, this is uh, basically just the two axis lathe, okay. but it, uh, but it does have. Uh, well, this one's three axis. It's got full uh, Y axis live tooling. Yeah, uh, which means uh, you know, with a live tooling, live tooling, you can actually uh, do some machining on the parts uh, versus just turning diameters. Also, gotcha. So gotcha. secondary operations for. So, so I guess to maybe explain that a little better, while the piece of steel is turning over on this side, the cutting head on this side can also turn and do other functions as well. So you could actually index or orient both sides. That's that's correct. Here's a, here's a good example of what it would be capable. Uh, not only could you turn these diameters, but you could come in and mill this slot, you know, for instance. Gotcha. You know, how, many, how many machining centers do you have in the in the steel division over here, well, Mike? Right now, I, I only have three, but I have wires hanging for seven more. Okay. Uh, we're still looking at uh, expanding our future capacity. So after we post this video, you're going to need to buy a couple more machines, I, I hope, right? I hope to. I hope to. <laughs> You know, in the in the last two years, you know, we've actually uh, um, increased our capacity by 30 okay. percent, and we easily have enough space to do that again. The purpose the purpose for having these, Doug, is uh, we can we can do a smaller quantity and a quicker turnaround for our customers. You know, in order to get the in order to get parts out the door based on rush deliveries uh, versus larger quantity production parts that we can run more cost effectively for our customers on the full blown CNC. Right. And and your your labor costs, your machine cost machining costs here are less too. If this is a thirty thousand dollar machine, running a job on your thirty thousand dollar machine is gonna cost less than running a job on your three or four hundred thousand dollar uh, milling machine. That's 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 absolutely right. Your 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 labor cost or not labor costs, but your ma machining costs are less when you have to quote a job on this machine versus another. So you, you got your hands full in quoting jobs as well. Yeah. Well, well, like I say, to be able to offer everything from prototypes to production, you know, you have to have a variety of uh, all the equipment. Let's uh, let's head on to the next building, Mike. How many square feet is this building? In, I guess including the basement. Uh, uh, probably twenty thousand square feet in this building. All right, and then you've got another building that you recently acquired. Was how many square feet in that one? Uh, that was uh, ten thousand square feet. All right. Now well, I'm going to throw you really on this because this goes way back when I think your dad started. How many square feet is the original building? The original building was 5,000 square feet, and I can still remember my dad and his partner, Sam Spencer, you know, Ken Gunn, yeah. you know, and uh, Sam uh, were partners. And Sam saying to my dad, what are we ever going to do with all this space? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, when they first built the first building on this site, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and you've more than more than quadrupled it, right? Because oh, you, yeah. you've also purchased another building that you're waiting to be able to move into that when you when you need to have that expansion capability. This here, when you guys look at this, you might not think much of it, but it's a very good example of a very good feed speed rate as well as a very good and sharp cutter. It didn't break that chip anywhere down the line. It looks like it's very uniform in the thickness. So not only are you guys uh, machining these parts, but you're also optimizing the cutting speeds and feeds with everything as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, you, uh, and the reason I brought that up because you can tell by looking at the chips. Well, that well, that's exactly right. You know, uh, a lot of the stuff that we do uh, uh, is because it's so precise at the back end, we can't induce any any stress into the material during the rough machining. Right. You know, and, and uh, that that stress you just talked about, none of this chip is purple, so it didn't come off cutting and burning it or overheating it. So, like you said, you're not introducing stress into those parts either. That, that's right. Yeah, and makes it so much easier in our uh, in our final operations to hold the tolerance as we hold. Welcome to Building One. This is our uh, this is our programming office. Uh, you know, for all of our uh, CNC milling machining centers. So that's that's the product you're going to be making, and then uh, that's kind of you can also help for programming toolpaths and things like that as well. 
What is your uh, programming software you guys are using? Uh, we're, we're using a 2D, 3D uh, Mastercam. Uh, we're creating all our solid models from, uh, you know, the Creo, you okay. know, which, is, uh, uh, which is pro engineering okay. software. 2D and 3D uh, programming for our CNC lays out of a Gibbs cam. Okay. You know, we've got a spree for our wire EDMs. You know, we've, uh, uh, we've got uh, an amazing amount of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, software, you know, that we utilize, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for all of our tooling paths uh, throughout the buildings. Well, let's head out on the shop floor then. Yeah, sound, sounds good. So, Mike, I couldn't help but notice you've got a, a crane here that runs the whole length of this building, huh? We, we do. Ultimately, uh, one of the biggest things in the company is material handling, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, something that, uh, that allows us to move materials uh, to and from, you know, safely. Well, you know, the nicest thing about this is, is this crane system spans the whole length of the building and the width of all your tooling centers. So you've got the ability to uh, access any one of these machines yeah. to, to lift the heavy parts up. We can uh, we can utilize the crane to uh, to load anything in any machine that's on the floor. And we can machine any form uh, in a 3D pattern, you know, uh, on that with the new tooling technology that uh, that we've been developing. And you, you talked about the, the tooling technology. I can remember back 20, 30 years ago, back when I was doing this stuff, you couldn't hard mill anything. Everything had to be done. All the all the formwork had to be done before that steel was heat treated. Right. And so that's just where the the tooling, the cutters, and the different uh, things for machining these things has gone in the last 20 years. Uh, yeah. The you know there's a lot of factors there, Doug. Uh, the rigidity of the machines. Uh, you know, uh, along with the tooling. And you're right. You know when uh, when when we first started in this business. Uh, that was completely unheard of. You know, uh, we, yeah. we never would have imagined uh, we would be able to do some of the things we're doing today. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, uh, you know, for instance, like, uh, that machine right there is a half a million bucks, you know, uh, and it is, uh, it is so solid. I think it weighs uh, roughly 24,000 pounds, yeah. you know, about 12 tons. Mike, I'm going to I'm going to test your memory here on this yeah. or your machining skills. On these on these hard milling machines, I know that spindle speed is a big criteria. Uh, it's also a selling feature of some of these machines where they can get up to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70,000 RPMs yeah. in their speeds and that's for the accuracy you're looking for for machining type tolerances. Do you have any rough idea what your spindle speeds on these things are? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I chose uh, I chose four machines: the F, uh, the Makino F5s with 20,000 RPM spindles. So uh, now this machine is a 30,000 RPM spindle, and the reason why you go up in the RPMs is because in micro machining, the smaller diameter of the cutting tool, mm -hmm. uh, the faster you have to spin it in order to in order to get your uh, your cutting conditions perfectly. You know, to be able to be able to. I, I want to say. And I'll show you this this and, not, and what you're talking about that speed required. That's my finger, my pointer finger, in relationship to the size of that cutter. So you need to have very very high RPMs. To make this cut efficiently. Yeah, and, and for instance, this tool holder is a shrink fit tool holder, so that the concentricity of each one of those cutting floats is zero. Right. It is uh, absolutely perfect, you know, in its rotation in order to get the same cutting pressure on each float and your cutting chips all equal. So let's touch on that real quick. You yeah. look at this cutter or this this fixture that this cutter goes in. Yeah. There's not a set screw around here to where there's a little bit of clearance to drop that cutter in and then you run a set screw over on that thing because yep. what that would do is make it wobble. Right. So you expand the, the fixture to accept the cutter and then it recools it back down and that's what's held in there by is, is yeah. just the compression if yeah. you will. Yeah, just the shrink compression from the heat. So and then to undo that you have to reheat it, pull it back out yeah. again. But, yeah. but we got into that years ago and it was actually pretty you know, you, you got to trust that that thing's seated in there correctly right. when this thing's spinning around and ready to take off like a bullet on you. Yeah, it it's incredible how precise that is. Right, so let's take a, just step back and, and look how how pretty and clean and nice and neat this machine is. It should be, it's only about a month old. Yeah, yeah and then brand if you new. Can, 
you can come over here, or actually I can grab it. And we're just making some tiny little parts there, which are these, I do believe. That's correct. And for reference to size, it's about the tip of my finger there. So they're going into machining the contour around this part. And that cutter head on there, I'm standing two feet away from it and I can barely see the tip of that cutter head. That's how small that thing is. These are uh, five high-speed hard mills. Uh, okay. Now these are more preheat treat machining centers and this is a lean manufacturing cell that we created. Okay. You know, uh, you know, for instance, uh, these are these are 12,000 horsepower. You know, they've got the uh, horizontal spindles on them and uh, 50 horse motors uh, to where you can take, uh, I want to say, you can take a half inch deep cut across a two inch wide piece of aluminum at 1200 inches a minute and peel that material right off of these things. Yeah. There's a lot of horsepower there. Yeah. I guess for the, for the, as good as we can get, we can show that thing machining the, the blocks. And I'm going to assume, Mike, if it's okay to pick this That's one up. That's what it's doing. It's, it's, it's pinching the bottom of this piece in a vise inside the machine and then it's programmed to go in there and cut this shape and then I'm going to assume that when this is done it'll get flipped over and then they machine off the, the clamping surface of that to produce a part. And if you look on the table here they've got their cutoff blanks that they produced over at their in-house steel department, put it into the machine, square it up and then get this part and then this will see several more steps and I don't know if Mike is that a product of this piece or not that's, that's what it's going to turn into so once they're done machining out all of all of these and let me throw that Good over thing. here for comparison it's about the exact same width and height and length and everything else so from this point then it'll go through and get all of its holes machined into it and there's tapped holes in there there's holes in the end so this, this machine here, you can do all these processes within that, that machine itself. Yeah, all in, uh, all in two operations. This is a kind of an interesting piece. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they've machined pockets. It's in a contour under the bottom side. They've machined grooves and a rib out of that side. That's actually a, a carrier puck for an assembly machine of EpiPens, you know, that automatically oh, yeah. assembles EpiPens. It's, oh, gee, you uh, didn't it's mention a, the EpiPens to uh, anybody sorry, earlier. It's a mechanical <laughs> device. Uh, yeah, we do so many different things, Doug. Uh, uh, we, make, um, we make gauges for knee and hip replacement joints for yeah. the medical industry. Uh, we make, uh, we make, make stuff for the, um, I guess, uh, oil and gas, you know, the things that uh, help filtrate, you know, all the sediments out of gasoline, yep. you know, in order to get your different grades. Yeah, we make the nozzles that extrude the ceramic, you know, that, uh, that actually, uh, you know, picks up the last of the sediments, you know, in order to get that pure, uh, that pure refined gasoline. We make uh, components that measure uh, you know, vertebrae, vertebrae replacement systems uh, that they're engineering and developing in Belgium. They're all three axis vertical machining centers, you know. Uh, and all part of the lean manufacturing, being in a group where yeah. tooling is utilized, tooling is shared, uh, it, it all stays in it, one spot? It, it is. You know, for instance, if we have an, op, uh, if we have an operation uh, where uh, one of our components uh, requires six different operations in order to get it to heat treat faster, we can do each operation you know, on all six machines and get it out the door in a, you know, in a assembly line process, so yep. to speak, uh, in order to hit the deliveries the customers need. So if you're looking for large quantities and fast deliveries, uh, this cell gives us the ability to do that. Yep, and it's, all, and it's all within arm's reach around here where you can access everything you need. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, yeah. And the other thing that I noticed right off the bat is it's clean, it's organized, and it looks like there's a place for everything. So this is a, a horizontal machining center, you know, and, um, and what's what's nice about this is if you have a high chip removal, you know, then uh, you know, the chips will fall off the parts, yeah. and they don't help dull the cutters, you know. But uh, but you can also rotate and do uh, multi-axis functions, uh, you know, as as well. And it looks like as as the chips fall, they probably fall into an auger. From the auger, they go to a conveyor conveyor into a hopper that you take to the recycling net.
And that's the fourth axis. You can rotate this set up different jobs up in here all at once. That's impressive. This machine, uh, this rapid, it rapid travels so fast. Uh, we actually, we actually had to glue this thing to the floor. Yeah. Hop in we had there. to glue it to the floor to keep the machine from shifting when it comes to a stop. Really? Oh yeah. It's got that much momentum. It, it, it's hard to push 22,000 pounds around. So, so they're doing the machining on this side of the machine and over here he can do his setups for the next part. So there you're saving time. The machine's running while on this end they're doing the setup. Constant spindle production. Yep. Yeah, and then that whole thing, is it on like a, 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 a table, an indexing table? It, it is. So it rotated, machine yeah. this side, set up on that side. So, I mean, you can see over here machining, and now he's over here setting up while that machine's still running. So that's efficiency. That's it's, what you work on. It's a dual palleting system. I guess we didn't talk about that, but you do do a lot of production machining we in, do. with tool wings. So, uh, in, a, in an industry where you might only be making one or two pieces, that yep. machine would not make sense at all. It would be best for maybe a small mill, but when, right. you're, when you're producing hundreds of the same part, it makes a lot more sense to have the palletization where you can keep the machine running and it's just a matter of a, hitting a button, stop, start, That's to, right. to index that. And then he can take as much time as he wants as long as it's within the cycle time of the machining over on this end. Being able to make sure that all the parts that we're making are accurate, you know, it's uh, you know, we have uh, we have measurement in every one of these apparations, you know, in order to to assure that they're in the condition that the customers order. Now, they, I'm going to set you up here. Yeah. The customer is paying you to inspect these, aren't they? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. But they're not paying us for a part that doesn't meet the specifications. Right. It just it just part of the uh, part of the process. Uh, you know, you have we we inspect every single operation of every job, and uh, and make sure that in final inspection that that part is absolutely what was ordered before it gets shipped. Yeah, and that's that's the hard part about producing products for this industry is is the customer doesn't want to pay for anything above and beyond yeah. that part that meets that blueprint spec. But what right. you guys put into place is making sure that every process and procedure that it goes through meets that print because there's really it's it's the checks and balances that you guys go through every day and every process yeah. to make sure that the customer isn't calling you back right. and saying hey this ain't working uh, for instance you know we have a chance to build uh, you know some parts made out of molybdenum uh, which is very expensive you know uh, molybdenum uh, can handle like 5,000 degrees of heat the molybdenum uh, cost for for five heat treat rack assemblies is $306,000. Okay, so every single piece of this, you know, every rail is about a thousand bucks. Wow. You know, for this project, right? You know, so so what you do is uh, you you gamble by pushing $300,000 worth of chips up on the line and you roll the dice and you count on uh, you count on people with their expertise to machine that thing properly to the print the first time, yeah. you know, in order to in order to try to achieve a profit. Sometimes it's a little more difficult than it appears. So let's take a walk over here and look at your CMM, a CMM coordinate measuring machine. Correct. And and they've got finished products that they're putting on there. They've got it locked down into a vise. They program off where that zero corner is or where the the center of that product should be. And yep. then it's got a touch probe that goes through. Yeah. So what he's doing here is, is that probe, it's a glass ball on the end of that touch tooling there. That is going down and it's touching the different portions of the steel. It gives you an exact dimension, uh, an exact measurement of that entire part. Uh, Jason is setting up now is a 200 piece job. You know, so to check 200 pieces 100% manually uh, would take considerably longer to do it automatically. Sure. You know, so you, you know, so you set up the program, takes a little longer on the front end, you know, but the speed of checking every part, making sure that, that you're 100% on the entire production run, you know, is, is crucial to this operation. Gotcha. You know. So this, this is a machine just like anything else, but this one the customer's not really paying for 
and, and I joke back about what I was yes. talking about earlier. The customer's right. not paying for this portion because it's not truly machining anything. It's it's verifying that what you machined is correct. Yeah. Just so you guys have an understanding that the, the amount of money that these business owners have to shell out for a piece of equipment they're not getting paid for is you know it could be anywhere from 100 to 200 or 300 thousand dollars. They pay for this piece of equipment that all it does is make sure that the machining was correct. In this industry, people look at the tooling industry. We'll, we'll call it tool and die, tool and mold, anything like that. Yeah. As we're walking around this facility, I'm comfortable in this shirt. It's not hot in here. It's not cold in here. It's not dirty. It's not dusty. And everybody thinks manufacturing yeah. plants are, are dirty and dungy. Some are, yeah. but the majority of all these plants that I've been to, and including ours, it was, it was as comfortable as being in your living room watching TV as background noise. Right now, the background noise I'm hearing is money falling. It's okay? machines running, it's, it's yeah. Machines running, yeah. it's making money, and that's what you want to do. So, you know, anybody that was ever interested in thinking, geez, would I, would I want to do something like that? I mean, these, this is nice, comfortable atmosphere, nice, comfortable yeah. conditions. The people are really decent around here. I know you're spoken highly of around the, the town and the community for the what you've given back and what you've done for those people. That's so, always good to hear. Yeah. So let's go let's go up and check out this lounge real quick. I yeah. think you guys will get a kick out of this. Uh, it it comes with the lounge is a lot of your personality because when I walked into it, that's Mike when I seen it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. that's Mike. Yeah. And and oh. all of his employees have the ability to go hang out in this lounge. And you also do a pool league every Tuesday night, I think you uh, said? Yeah, we have, a, we have a pool league in our lounge Tuesday night. You know, not every, uh, not every coal mine like this has its own bar. Yeah. You know, you know but, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, uh, so, it, it is nice, you know, to, to after hours, you know, if somebody wants to, uh, you know, sit down, relax, watch TV, shoot a game pool, or yeah. play some shuffleboard. So there's some, there's some discretion yeah. you give to your employees. You know, okay, respect it, enjoy it, it's here for you guys but it's just something you don't see in a lot of manufacturing plants. Yeah. So let's go up and take a look well, at that. Well, they have to save me a beer too. Yeah, yeah let's, let's go head up there. Uh, you know, of course, we got the TV screen yep. to where we can put up any project, uh, 3D models, blueprints, any topic of discussion, uh, you know, and, and go over it in our planning process. You know, um, what's, really, what's really been beneficial is we'll come up here and just casually shoot the breeze after hours about how we might be able to improve what we're doing. It's a friendly atmosphere, you know, and say for instance, like if you're entertaining customers, but you're trying to talk business and mm -hmm. you're in a very noisy and, you know, restaurant environment. Yeah. This makes it pretty easy. So, and, and I'd like to point out that uh, we look around the room here, there's some, there's some couches, some lounge chairs, whatever some pool tables that look like you you've picked up used out of maybe some bars or something uh, I, I don't know where you got yeah them. actually uh, they were both free this is a uh, you know a friend of mine's uh, it was in his dad's basement okay you know uh, you know that was uh, that was a buddy of mine he was uh, moving to South Carolina you yeah, know you got and, a shuffleboard and, over there uh, yeah shuffleboard uh, you know came out of the local uh, fire hall you know that uh, they were looking to utilize their space differently all right you know, Mike so so tell me what's What's the what's the number one rule up here that if your employees come up and they use this, what well, what do they need to do for you? Oh, I mean, well, they're they're not allowed to completely empty the fridge. They have to save a beer for me. There you go. <laughs> you know, so, but you know. I mean, it's it's nice yeah. that that you've got employees that you know that you can trust right. to open this up to use, and uh, mm. and it's nice enough that you're giving this to them yeah. to give them a place. And, and again, you talked about the, the Tuesday night pool league. They right, come up right. Everybody yeah. appreciates, uh, you know, this, uh, 
you know, our, our jig grinder uh, built this table out of a tree in his backyard. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, and uh, you know, you know, made that, uh, you know, made that in the barrel and donated it, you know, to the shop. It's a. Uh, you can play little cards there if you wanted it's a, to. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. a it's family event center, you yeah. know for sure. So yeah, I mean, we enjoy it. This is one of those things that you don't see in your average uh, manufacturing facility. That's why I kind of want to touch on it because. It's it's you as the owner giving back to the yeah. employees. Well, I want to I want to thank you really for uh, for doing this because uh, it seems that you know any kid in high school will think of a manufacturing arena as a coal mine. Yeah, uh, they just kind of associate it with uh, a very dirty, unsophisticated operation. You know, and uh, you know, gosh, uh, uh, we've we've got people here. You know. Uh, you know the cool part, I guess, is you can never stop learning in this industry. Yep. You know it's ever changing. You know it's a uh, it's like I say, and you can see it going from running bridge ports 30 years ago to high tech, uh, you know, 3D modeling and programming and you know computer control. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, robotic yeah. situation today. And you know the the nicest thing about this industry is you can you can come out of high school, you can come out of college, you can have a degree. Mm -hmm. But 90% of what you do here, you're going to be trained on the job or they're going to send you to training where you yourself, the company, pays that employee, pays for that employee's training to go do that. Because you're going to pay their wage while they're going through the training and then you also have to pay for that training cost. Yeah. So, so it, does somebody need to go to school for this? Maybe, maybe not. But you're going to learn 99, 90, 99% right. right here on the job. Well, just to expand on that, Doug, uh, you know, we have uh, our own apprentice program internally. Okay. You know, uh, you know, we do all of our schooling, all of our math, all of our basic blueprint reading, all the way up to, uh, you know, programming and 3D solid modeling. You know, uh, you know so uh, there's an <laughs> endless amount of education right here. You know, we've got, uh, you know. I don't know how many thousands of years of experience, mm -hmm. you know, you know, with, uh, you know, you know, you figure we've got, we've got 60 people that have been here, I want to say, uh, that have been in the business for close to 40 years. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, so for them to want to pass on that knowledge and information to the younger, uh, younger guys to, to you know, uh, that really could make a great living, you know, here in Northwest PA. Yeah, uh, it's a, it, you know, it's a great opportunity that I think very few people recognize or know about. Now, you guys accept applications all the time. Always looking for that that next best uh, new kid coming through the door. Every day. Yeah. Every day. Yep. Uh, we certainly welcome, uh, uh, you know, the chance to give uh, to give that gentleman or young lady an opportunity as well. I don't think we're we're that demanding. You know, any longer. Sure. You know, uh, we're more, like, say, more computer oriented now. It, you know. You know, so there's there's a lot of kids out there right now that are doing this with their video games and yep. they're doing this. This is a perfect industry for those kids. The mm. you, the, the Minecraft. My yeah. kids were in Minecraft and they built these cities. Sure. Sure. That's just. This is a real life version of Minecraft. You're building things. And these kids are smart. You know, they know that uh, ten years out of high school. If they go to college, you know they have an opportunity to break even if they get a really good paying job. Yep. You know, uh, you know, ten years in the tool business, and they'll be uh, over a half a million dollars, uh, you know, to the good, versus breaking even. You know, you know this that's, this that's, this industry has its appeal. Yeah, there's ten years of income. Yeah. For a kid that comes into something like this out of high school, and like you're talking the Ivy League school, there's ten years of debt before the income starts. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and it, you do it every day. You calculate sure. it in your head every day when you buy a piece of equipment, what is my return on investment going to be? Yeah. If I buy this $200,000 machine, how many years is it going to take me and how much work is it going to take me to pay that back? Mm. So in in the human aspect of it, you guys that are out there that, that might have kids that are getting out of high school and looking for jobs, yeah. you know, you got to think about, okay, where is that return on investment going to be? Mm. Do I send them to college or do I send them to trade school? I think right now yeah. trade school is a much better payoff. I don't know that, but you know we still need plumbers and carpenters and machinists and all that that absolutely aren't afraid to work with their hands. A abs absolutely, you know it's a yeah yeah. And like to say, we have our own internal trade school here. Mike, I can't thank you enough for showing us around your facility. 
allowing us to come in and do a tour, yeah. um, showing the viewers that I guess mm -hmm. there's there's way more out there that they might not get to see. And you know, in a, a family owned business like yourself, you've got here a nice place to uh, provide for your employees and things like that. So uh, I guess you have anything you'd like to touch on on finishing up this, this video of, of Imperial Carbide here in Meadville, Pennsylvania? Well, Doug, I'll tell you, I don't know if uh, anybody uh, else that could have, uh, uh, you know, come in here and, uh, you know, had a, a great understanding of, uh, you know, what we do, you know, uh, with your past experience. I'm truly appreciative of, uh, you know, the time, uh, you know, to take a look around. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, and, and I would just say that, uh, you know, we are, uh, we're, we're a unique breed, uh, you know, in, you know, in the manufacturing arena, you know, and, uh, you know, and uh, I'll tell you, the, um, the more we can uh, somehow allow other people to experience what we do, uh, you know, and, and how pertinent it is that this continues to take place, I think it's a, it's a great thing. It is a part of my history. It's a part of Mike's history and mm -hmm. his background. And I like to try to be able to bring this type of video to you guys to bring some light to the manufacturing industry because we all know that uh, it, it is a... It's a very unique industry, and uh, if you watch any of the Mike Rowe stuff where he does the dirtiest jobs and things like that, he talks a lot about the uh, manufacturing industry and, and mm -hmm. the people that you need. So I guess I, I, I want to try and bring these videos to you guys. If you enjoy watching them, I guess let me know, and if you'd like to see more of them, we'll try and schedule more up. Mike, I can't thank you enough for letting us come in today. It's been a pleasure. Your, your place, what you've done, what you've been able to do and how you've been able to grow it, it's, it's been fabulous. Yeah, and I think yeah. maybe we ought to sit back and celebrate your, uh, your first YouTube video. That's what I'm talking about. And uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll get this passed out there so everybody can see it. So Mike, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it, Doug. We'll see you again. Yep. Thumbs up, throw Thumbs me some up. subscribes, and uh, we'll see you again on the next one. Subscribe is good.